Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb, and today delighted to be joined by Steve Toland from Transfix. Steve, how are you? Uh, very good. Thanks for having me on. Listen, it's great to have you. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for doing it. Really exciting time for you, for you and the business. Despite this, uh, this, you know, this global climate, there's there's growth that's happening with Transfix at the moment. Um, you've had some uh, investment, I understand, into in, you know, into the business. Uh, and things seem to be going really positively for you, for you. But uh, before we get into that and talk a little bit about why that's happening, give us a bit of background to uh, to Transfit, your story, and, and and where you are today. Uh, well, just a little bit of background on us. So, so we are uh, fintech. It's been going about four years now. Uh, we are building what I call a, a hosted API translation service in the fixed income markets. Um, and what we're doing is is basically building a, a if you like a platform product which enables banks. Um, and now looking at buy side, uh, enabling those participants to build trading systems um, to, to help them innovate uh, and take advantage of the uh, changes which are actually taking place in the, uh, in the fixed income market. So we have like uh, some real market structure changes going on in terms of you know, growth of all to all trading venues and new liquidity uh, um, sources and, and different types of data and then people have got a different regulatory environment as well so there's a, a sort of a growing demand for people to be able to build their own platforms and that's what we're trying to facilitate. And it's, and it's been a sort of perfect storm for that recently hasn't it in terms of the, uh, the innovation in some of the capital markets around you know, that, that particular area and if you, if you look at that happening and so much, uh, so much um, excitement around the products and the business at that sort of stage how, how's, uh, how's the current situation impacted you in the business in the marketplace are you seeing much change in that are you still seeing the appetite or is there a little bit more caution uh specifically from the covid19 uh situation i mean obviously it's a it, it's, it's a massive change and and uh for all businesses etc we're very fortunate in capital markets that we you know we we haven't got to close down like my pub across the street or the co local coffee mm. shops, et cetera, so we can keep operating. Uh, our customers can keep operating, and obviously um, there's been a lot of volatility in the markets. Um, so there is the underlying demand for people to trade bonds or swaps or futures is still there um, and, and is growing. Um, what has, I think, changed you know, with everybody sort of working from home is, is, is just the way, particularly on the bank side, we've observed with our customers is the way that they can sort of like think differently. Um, so, you know, just even with banks, it was like, you know, having traders working from home and trading from home mm. was a no-no, couldn't do that. Yeah. And now yeah. most banks are. Um, and, um, you know, we've got, um, uh, we, we, we host for our customers basically in a, in a co-location environment in Equinix, or, you know, we, we've built our, our development stuff is in the cloud, et cetera. Um, we've got one bank who does, well, they, you know, they trade from the cloud, but they call it a proof of concept just to sort of, you know, um, appease their internal information <laughs> security people, et cetera. But uh, um, recent conversations with everybody working from home is like, we need everything, the world has changed. Uh, people need to operate from home. People need to host everything in the cloud. People need to look at how they can manage all their security. For, you know, if their traders can be at home, I mean, essentially they can, they can do anything from uh, a, a cloud-based uh, environment, et cetera. And so, so um, I think this will push forward, particularly in the bank environment, you know, people wanting to digitalize as much as possible. And I know that can be a very broad term, digitalization, but essentially people will say that, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the most innovative ways we can work? What are the most cost-effective ways that we can work? And how can we access new markets and new liquidity, et cetera? Mm. I think that's been one of the sort of themes of the conversations I've been having. I've been you know, speaking to people like yourself now for, uh, you know, for, for a good few weeks on, on a daily basis and just sort of getting the temperature of what's happening. And that sort of rapid uh, speed of innovation and digitalization ar around things is, is something which has been, I think, will be one of the lasting legacies of all, of all this. You know, banking has been traditionally a very reluctant uh, you know, digital innovator, I think. And it's been a, a struggle to say that here's great products that can really improve the uh, yeah, the service and, and the, the productivity of people and because of concerns as exactly as you say around cloud and security and such like it's been a little uh, str str uh longer to, to to update i think this will be one of the you know the sort of key benefits to, to you know to, to what's to what's happened for a long lasting uh impact on on the sector what else do you think is going to sort of really uh 
change for financial services and, and technology in particular over the, the, the coming years? Um, well, I, I think this is just part of the general thing of the way we work. I mean, you know, we're doing this over a Zoom call now. Um, we found it, you know, to get holders, you know, stakeholders together at a bank, et cetera, you know, we can get them all together on a Zoom call. And it's sort of easier than actually trying to work to, to get everyone together you know, yeah. physically, um, you know, so, you know, we're often sort of held back by, you know, we've got to wait till certain executives in town from New York or et cetera. And it's sort of like, well, we don't have to wait for that now. We'll just ever get everyone on the zoom. So, so certain, yeah. um, in the way we interact with customers, I think that that has changed. Um, and I think for the better actually, yeah. um, um, uh, what is not so good is, um, from my perspective is the, uh, a lot of the sort of conference events, um, that we do. Um, so uh, obviously, um, you know, from a marketing and, and sort of sales perspective, you know, we tend to sort of build our profile and footprint by attending various sort of fixed income uh, mm. events, etc. Most of those have been cancelled. Yeah, um, yeah. and, 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 and there's been sort of, you know, some virtual events, etc. But one of the things you do get out um, it is uh, of attending those conferences is not only do you sort of go to the panels and you learn some stuff, et cetera, but you also, you go to the bar afterwards and you meet three Absolutely. people that you wouldn't have met before. And I, I, that networking of meeting those new people that you weren't expecting to meet, that needs to be done in person. I think we're losing that at the moment. Um, um, so so, how, so I hope how, that comes back. Yeah. And I, and I think, it, yeah, I think it would, it, there's, there's, you know, everyone's so in the dark about what happens next and how all this sort of uh, develops. Um, but I think you know, there, there's there's so many different ways of doing things now. And as you say that there's virtual events. If you could if you could have a magic sort of wand and, and work out how, because we're always looking at this ourselves about how we can put people together. Part of our sort of uh, modus operandi is to connect people in the industry, and we've got that sort of uh, you know ability to to put people in front of people. When we look at you know sort of various different areas from vendor to you know service provider to end user, bank brokerage, asset manager, hedge fund, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm just thinking of all, always thinking of different ways that we can put those sort of communities together and do things like this, because you're right. You, you, I think everyone I speak to is, uh, is missing that sort of opportunity to do the business in the bar, to do the, uh, those sort of things. And I'm just wondering if there's things there that actually we, you know, maybe we can take this offline, but I think there's things there about how we can, you know, we can continue to connect people and give those opportunities because, you know, as, as we were saying earlier on, we're not sure if this is going to be something where we get people back together in six months time in 12 months time or 18. And, and, uh, you know, the show's got to go on, right? And as you say, there's no there's no shortage of uh, of business in capital markets, and there's a need to uh to you know to innovate and need to get these products in front of the right people. Um, as I, I, I digress completely from where I was going. It just got me thinking in terms of where we where we go. Coming back to this, um, it, it's it's as we said, it's an exciting time for for your for your business, and it's a business that's been, from my knowledge and what I've seen, a pretty tight knit team. Um. You know, as that tight knit team and, and a lot of what the work that you do relies on working together, right? Um, tell us a little bit about the challenges you found that internally and how you've how you've mastered those. Uh, well, I don't think we've mastered them, <laughs> but they're challenges. Um, so, so one of the things that's actually very interesting about how we work is we um, we uh, we we do this sort of a process of software development called continuous delivery. Um, uh, which and there's, there's different sort of aspects to that, but one of the key aspects uh, to it is that the um, uh, the development is actually done in pairs. It's called pair programming. So we actually have two developers sharing a, a keyboard and the same screen to actually write lines of code, and they actually write tests before they write any of those lines of code. And and so um, and, and then and then you know further to that is the way we've operated is we've always had everyone together all in one office. You know. Um, so obviously we've grown a little bit this year and you know the team's now up to 16 people and we're adding added another person yesterday um but one of the things of, of uh, that just sort of hit, hit us immediately sort of seven eight weeks ago is like well how are we going to do this pair programming if we're all working from home so mm. the first sort of couple of days people were sort of like working independently on the development side um and then one of the uh small you know, the developers actually break into sort of sub teams, et cetera, to working on specific pieces of work. And one of the teams sort of had a real bash at trying to do the, the pair programming, programming remotely um, and had to, and they had some, some real frustrations in terms of 
uh, how they actually sh shared the screen. You've got it. You've got it. You've got it to physically have two screens at home, and then you both be, need to be remote, remoting into a single box rather than one guy, you know, driving stuff on his local workstation, and then basically mm. someone, the remote person, going through two home Wi-Fi's. Um, so if you both remote in, they seem to avoid a lot of the latency delays, and and that seems to have been very effective. And the and the feedback from so it took a, sort of a couple of weeks to work it all out, but the feedback has been. Um, we can maintain the sort of collaborative way of working. Um, people said that, you know, it's a lot better than working on their own all day, particularly from a development uh, environment. Mm. And you're still able to sort of cross share um, um, the way they sort of cross share all the uh, ideas, uh, ideas between the pairs of developers and across the teams is actually by group chat. And so we mm. have different group chats going on, which are going all day for team through A, Slack, team B. Through Slack, I presume, or? Uh, no, we don't like to use Slack because uh, okay. they wanted to charge. They wanted to charge us some money. So um, <laughs> we we have a core development team who we we like to use open source software. Um, okay. It's almost on a point of pride that we don't like to pay for any software. So so we did use Slack, and then as soon as they wanted to charge us a license, we said, well, we're not having that anymore. So we usually use uh, we use Google Chat. It's free. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it sort of does the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's probably not a very good advert for Slack. I hope for <laughs> no one from there is watching. Um, sure they won't, they won't yeah. cry too much from it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so so yeah. But uh, there's a uh, chat's used a lot, and then we do have a lot of the um, uh, the video, the Zoom video, or the Google Meet videos as well. Um, so if people get stuck on a problem. Essentially, they have an immediate break breakout, or they'll send something out on chat and saying, "Hey, we're discussing this issue. If anyone wants to join." Um, yeah. so, it, so we were able to do a lot of the collaboration um, uh, is basically working between that remote pair programming and using um, chat and 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 lots of daily video conferences uh, we do a daily stand-up as well where we make sure we go through well, it used to be stand up where we're in the office now we're sat down at a screen, <laughs> but we we do make sure we go through everyone on the team to make sure we, you know we um, say hello to everybody and we make sure everybody you know sort of knows what they're doing you know, the previous day and what they were working on etc and that's the full the full team get together for that, do they? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We've yeah. been and, and then we did do as well. We used to have a, a sort of a, a bi-weekly what we call retrospective meeting, where the idea is every couple of weeks you just sort of go through you know what's going right and what's gone wrong over the last sort of couple of couple of weeks. And the idea is you you spend fifteen minutes on the what's going right, and then spend sort of three quarters of an hour on what's going wrong. When we when we went home working, we decided to run those every week um, because there was additional issues associated with you know we're all remote etc. Um, but we've actually gone back to bi-weekly with that because we you know it seems to be working okay and you know that seems to be about the right length of time for that. Yeah, and in terms of um, you know this 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 general communication, what would you say would be some of the best learns that you've had? I mean, obviously there you're, you're talking about utilizing multiple streams of technology. Uh, and, and you've worked hard to find the, the perfect solution for the pair programming side of it. If you're talking there about a, a, a sort of fairly close 16 person organization and keeping that sort of culture and character that, that I know that's been a real, I speaking to Belinda, it's a big part of, uh, of what you guys have achieved so far. How are you keeping that sort of stuff alive? How are you keeping the personality of the group and, and the yeah. engagement going? Well, the hardest thing actually is with new joiners. So we've actually, partly with your guys' help as well, we've, you know, we've, we've hired um, four new people um, this year, and you know, and, actually, um, and there's more to come. And you know, I was actually speaking with one of the teams you know, on Friday, and he says, you know, this is really weird. You know, I've worked here a month now, and he goes, I've never been to the office or actually met anyone in person. He goes, which is a, <laughs> it's a brave really, new world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really is a sort of a strange thing. Um, so, so, so the hardest thing is, is, is onboarding new people, I think. Um, and we have been trying to, so there is that sort of, as I said, the daily stand-up meeting, but we also do, um, we've been making sure that, um, uh, you know, they get a company laptop, which is actually pre-configured for them with all the internal systems and, to, you know, obviously we have security with VPN and all that sort of type of stuff. And, um, so they actually receive a new laptop, which has got everything done for them. So they're not going to sit at home saying, I can't get into this, I can't get into that, etc. So that's all sort of pre-done. And then, and then it's um, a lot of it is 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 just remotely taking them through the system. The thing you would try and do the office in the office to get people up to speed, mm. but you just have to do remotely. Um, and then we have some social stuff as well. There's coffee breaks and um, and we even have a virtual pub 
which is, I, I forget the name of it, I think it's called the Rose and Ring Buffer. Um, <laughs> so, um, which is a, a pub technical name, it's an in-joke from the techies. Um, but that takes place every Friday, so not everyone goes to that. But um, if you I heard a great name for a uh, for a for a pub in a in an or a bar area in an office the other day, which was called the office. So people could uh, phone home and say they've just got to stay late in the office when they were doing it, and not and not be not be lying. So I love I love the uh, I love the innovation, uh, you know, the social innovation that some of this has uh, has come through, and seeing companies do this. Sort of stuff I, been there. I think if you told me eight weeks ago that I'd be <laughs> quite keen to go to a virtual pub. <laughs> well, I said you're crazy. Um, but you know, I mean, that's actually been quite good. I have to say, it's just a way of catching up with people as well. So. Needs must, isn't it? Needs must. Mm. And in terms of um, in terms of what the future looks like, I mean, uh, we let's let's talk in the near future. We we were talking before about how you uh, reintegrate people and what it looks like. There's so many unknowns here about what government says and when we can get people back. You've got you know family members i think of, of the team who are in you know, who are in primary care of covid-19 etc cetera, etc cetera, and looking at you know, the first responders should we say it's 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 a really difficult sort of thing to to run a business not knowing you know physically when you're going to be getting people back in in there what what's what's your take on that what are you what are you seeing and what's the prediction uh well we haven't made any any firm plans yet i mean we're able to operate you know remotely at the moment um and obviously uh, until we think we can actually get everyone back in the office safely you know we're mm. going to take it you know step by step um i mean one of the things i always sort of say is sort of like you know health and family first so if there's any sort mm. of risk or anyone feels uncomfortable you know we're not going to have them come back into the office um, um imagine where, different where, people are having different sort of levels of enthusiasm to do that as well i presume yeah i, I mean certainly um uh, one of the things, you know, it, for the new joiners, you know, it really does help to, to have everybody in the office, etc. But we've got to sort of take it step by step. Um, um, we also have a, you know, thing we've got customers chasing us for deliveries, etc. So, you know, a lot of it is, you know, what's the best way can we work and what's the best way we can get everything done. So, um, you know, if everyone's working at home and they're safe, why risk people going into the office? Exactly, yeah. Steve, there's an interesting take here that, that uh, you know, a number of companies have obviously sort of taken their foot off the gas and said, right, let's wait for, to see what happens before we grow the team. You guys have been um, sort of fairly aggressively scaling out. So what was, the, what was the thought process behind that? Well, that was actually part of the, obviously, to do with the, the fundraising that we did. Um, so we, you know, we got a, a, quite a good level of traction where we've got like five bank customers now, but they're all sort of saying, hey, we want you code to more to more fixed income trading venues and we wanted to build more out more of the product set um and so we you know um uh, you know working from home aside we had a business plan which was basically we wanted to um, ra raise some capital which you know obviously very thankful for the likes of hsbc and ing joining the likes of city and commerce as strategic investors and as also albion and illuminate put, put put further cash into us which is great um, but with that money, you know, the business plan is that we'll basically you know, double the size of the technical team over the next uh, year um, and, and then also start to expand the product set to not only covering uh, the needs of the, uh, the sell side banks, uh, but also actually start to uh, provide coverage and product set uh, for buy side customers as well. We think there's a big opportunity there. So that's mm -hmm. part of the sort of same business plan and we're we're operating to that and the, the demand doesn't seem to have changed from customers uh, for, for wanting wanting that and it's just we we talk to them remotely now um so so that's what's been driving that and and um it was actually very interesting actually going through that series a process um mm. the, the the investors view was that you know if they took a, a you know a long-term view a 10-year time horizon then you know there will be you know more digitalization and more automation in the in the fixed income trading markets um mm. and that is going to move to the buy side as well uh, mm. and you know essentially they said you know you know obviously we actually closed the round in the middle of sort of working from home but they said the long you know long term that didn't actually change their their investment outlook i think that's a really because you know we saw we saw very early on in this this whole process sequoia you know issuing warnings to uh uh, businesses who, they, who they'd invest in and such like, and, uh, and I think there's there's been this sort of uh, disparity of views between between VC money and you know, there's um, in, you know, investment money that some people have sort of put their foot down and uh, others have sort of scaled back a little bit. 
I think it's testament to you uh, and the whole you know process and game plan, as you said, look, people were taking a 10 year view of what's happening in the marketplace and digitalization, et cetera, within you know, fixed income markets. I think that's probably moved forward an, an, an awful lot uh, quicker than that as well. We probably, you know, I think it's anything between two and 10 years worth of uh, acceleration in the whole process and adoption of that, that sort of technology as well. Coming back into it and, and saying, you know, from, from an investment standpoint, whenever I've spoken to investors, and, I, and I'm, I'm always really interested in what, what makes a, a, a good fintech investment, they'll look at founding teams, they'll look at, um, you know, track record, they'll look at, uh, you know, the, the, the value that they give to, to customers. There's naturally, uh, you know, parts, uh, uh, big parts of all of that, which you can talk about with Transfit. But what, why, why do you think people were so, you know, so happy to give you investment at this sort of time? I think, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, they, they could see the demand was there. Um, mm. There is, particularly in the fixed income space, there is not many vendors in in the market. Um, there is, we won't talk about them on this call, but there is one big dominant vendor who has a 75% share of sell side banks. And, you know, uh, uh, competition is healthy, you know, um, mm. and so they, they, they want alternatives. Um, so there's that. We also were able to show that we've actually got um, some good traction with our existing customers. You know, so so people, you know, it's um, quite easy. You know, obviously, when we started out, you know, we had a sort of a PowerPoint and a, and a good team. But they, they say, yeah, you know, come back and, you know, when you've actually built some of this and it's actually fully in production. And we were able to sort of demonstrate that, yeah, we've got, um, you know, some serious banks and they're, and they're trading um, you know, production um, uh, bonds with those Euro European government bonds and uh, uh, European credit bonds are all going through us now. And they were able to see how yeah, this does work. Uh, and what they, they also liked as well is that obviously we're trying to do this sort of platform approach. Um, and um, that testing I talked about earlier through um, uh, 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 the continuous delivery process and the pair program, uh, programming process, what comes out of that is we're actually able, because our, our code is fully tested and stress tested every day, we're actually able to release to our customers on a daily basis. And so from a, uh, a DevOps perspective, it means that you know, we can adapt to a changing environment, which certainly gives them a, a degree of comfort because they keep coming to us and saying, actually, we know we asked you to do A, B, and C, but we need D and E as well. Can you do that? You know, there's, there's a conversation about whether we're going to charge any more money, et cetera, but, you know, but we can do it and we can operate. Uh, and deliver that very quickly. But they also want to build out on their side, they want to build out integrated test systems which, which, which connect to ours. Because um, ultimately a bank doesn't want to take six weeks or even six months to release its own software. They want to be able to release on a daily basis as well. So particularly working with um, Citibank in their innovation lab, we did mm. quite a lot of work between our development guys and the city development guys to basically you know, work out how they could integrate some of their test systems with our test systems so they can basically test you know their desktop GUI through Transfic and then through to the trading uh, venues UAT test environment and they can test everything end to end and be sure it's going to work and then be able to basically release on their side quicker mm. uh, and I think some of the investors when they saw that we that's the type of thing we were doing they could see there was real value out there. I think City have, um, have, have constantly been at the sort of forefront, haven't they, of, uh, of sort of fintech and you know, the very early early business to put their uh, you know, line in the sand and say, look, we're, we're here to, um, uh, you know, to, to really embrace this sort of stuff. Have you found them you know, a, a really useful business to be working with, particularly, I guess, if nothing else, in the proximity of the offices? Well, I, um, I mean, the real, I think, game changer for us was um, obviously this, they invested, which is fantastic, but mm. moving into their innovation lab, and it's actually that, that fit, uh, physical proximity. So, you know, so mm. we had our own, you know, they, get, they gave us a sort of a separate office area, but I mean, literally, you know, the team we were working with was like six feet away, you know, mm. and so they had an issue, they could, you know, they didn't even have to shout, they actually throw a tennis ball at our window. Um, <laughs> but that sort of going back and forth is huge. Um, and it worked really well. I mean, it's a shame. We're actually, we had to move three floors down because the, the, the room we had wasn't big enough anymore. So, um, so we're not that far away. Um, but, but essentially... Social, that, social distancing, though, no, no, so it probably yeah, yeah. helps you out. <laughs> um, but, you know, no, I mean, we're very thankful for City, you know, for A, providing us that environment, that close integration. And, and it was, you know, 
they made design suggestions on what they want to basically enhance how our product works. Um, and then it, it's obviously it's testing. And, and, you know, it's, it's one thing sort of building sort of software, but if you hand it to people and then they don't use it for a long time, you sort of run into problems. When you have a customer who actually sort of tests things uh, thoroughly, then it gives you a certain degree of confidence that things are going to work. So that was, that was really, really helpful from City uh, towards, towards us. I'm interested in, in your sort of position at the moment as a sort of uh, you know, founder and CEO of, 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 a, of a business about what are some of the sort of things that, that, that are, 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 you know, you're there and you're responsible for the business, you're responsible for the, you know, the people you brought into that sort of moment. What are some of, some of the things which are sort of pressing in your mind? What are the, the sort of concerns you have at the moment? What are the things that, that are at the forefront of your thinking? I, I, I'm, I'm smiling. So I, I think it's appropriate to call myself founder, but I've never feel, felt comfortable calling myself CEO, particularly when, <laughs> when we had, there was only three of us and we actually had no customers and no money. It just felt a little bit, <laughs> A little, bit, a little bit out over my own skis, calling myself CEO. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I mean, the main thing is it, um, when when we founded uh, Transfer and myself, we've got uh, two fantastic business partners who are developers, Chad Gaddy and uh, Tom McKee. Um, uh, one of the things that we wanted, we wanted a if you like a technical infrastructure environment, which is basically technically led. Um, but it was very sort of collaborative and sort of team driven, um, you know, and that sort of goes, you know, at board level, you know, obviously we have VC investors, et cetera, but we have two developers sitting on the board. I mean, yes, they are co-founders, but there's not many companies that have two developers sitting on a board. So we want to make sure we were sort of technically led um, and we wanted to make sure that we had a sort of a, a very sort of collaborative team working environment. We also, you know, as much as we can, make it a bit of fun. And if you, you know, if you work with good people, um, and it's sort of a fun environment, then a lot of other things sort of take care of themselves, you know? Mm. Um, so, um, obviously you need some cash, um, and, um, you need to make sure that the product works, but we, you know, we're very lucky. We, we, we've got some excellent engineers. Um, and the, you know, obviously I think the technology sort of, you know, I, I, I say it second to none, not having anything to do with it because you know sometimes I'm a little bit surprised they let me in the office actually, um, <laughs> but um, but keeping trying to keep that um, if you like the team approach going is, is something yeah. that you know I think we've got now but we really want to um, basically try and protect that um, you know because if you've got good you know not only strong engineers but when they're working together as a team you you, yeah. see, you, you get that that much more coming out of it. I think that's a common theme, isn't it? And it sounds like you guys are already doing a great job on that with, you know, the social side of it, what you can do, but also just that sort of collaboration and communication. It's where everything either for, you know, forms together or falls apart, isn't it? It's about how well, you know, uh, messages are communicated and people work together. So I'm really pleased you're, you're working that out. Let's, let's move it on to the more positive side of that then. What, what about the future? What are, what are the ambitions? What's exciting you? What, you know, what, what are, where do you see the opportunities in all of this at the moment? Well, um, so uh, partly I alluded it to earlier. The, you, the investment money is going to is basically double the size of the uh, of, of the development and technical team, so we can build out that many more venues to suit the existing customers and new customers. Uh, we will move into the buy side. Um, we uh, there's a, there's one asset class which keeps coming up, and we have lots of uh, talking about, um, and that is uh, repos. Um, so we actually do one of our part-time advisors is a guy named Godfrey Davids, who's uh, uh, very well known in the repo space. And the repos aren't that well, um, as I put it, use a sort of proper word, electronified. Um, so, it, you know, they're even sort of further behind the other fixed income asset classes. So we, we think uh, there is a great opportunity in that space. Um, and then we are doing, we actually do have a, um, a, a one market data customer already they came to us last year and they said hey can you code to some emerging market menus and some crypto venues and translate those apis to a common format so it's like it's not fixed income focus um and it's not trading focus but um it's sort of um shown that the the, the sort of other things we can do on the core platform um, and that's, and that's you know, them coming to you was it, it uh, yes uh, they, they approached us and um uh, nice. uh, and and we saw that there was an opportunity uh, to do that with them, essentially. I mean, it was it was very similar. You know, we, again, we said the core business was 
translating APIs in the fixed income markets. Well, this is translating APIs, but just for market data. Some of them actually are fixed income and money market uh, data, as you but some has been crypto venues, etc. Wow, so it's exciting, exciting stuff. And so many routes to take, many paths to, uh, to, to follow with it. And in terms of the market as a whole um, and how you see this sort of impact that we're in uh, um, difficult economic times, uh, if, and as I say, probably minimised a little bit within the uh, capital markets on this, on this occasion. What's your prediction for how the recovery comes about what we're going to see and put your ec economist hat on? What, what, are you, what are you predicting for the industry? I don't want to make many predictions, Toby. I'd say I've seen <laughs> share picks I've made over the years. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'm the I, was last speaking, I was speaking. I was speaking to someone earlier on who just uh, pre uh, pre COVID nineteen just bought some bought some stock in uh, Zoom. So there's 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 someone who I need to be asking that question maybe. Well, I, I can tell you how bad I am, I, and I'm showing my age here, etc. But I, I do remember when I lived in New York. I remember passionately debating with people about how that Amazon just wasn't worth the money, and that was like I don't know, like fifteen <laughs> years ago. Yeah, so it shows that I don't know a lot. Um, I don't know, it, there's no doubt that um, it, it's, it's sort of an easy thing to say, but um, obviously uh, capital markets will go more digital, et cetera. I think what is going to change hugely is, um, it, uh, is the use of cloud uh, mm. technology. I mean, everything, everyone's just going to host everything in the cloud. It's just, it is secure. I mean, not every bank believes that at the moment, but it is because you do all your home banking at home. You know, so why can't they do the capital markets trading at home? Mm. Uh, 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 sorry, cloud hosted, um, and then um, you know, and, and there's, it's, it's just fantastic flexibility in terms of being able to spin up test environments or spin up a DR environment as and when you need it, or you know, you want to deploy. I mean, you, know, you deploy into well, not deploy to fifty different data centers around the world simultaneously. Well, you can do that with the cloud, etc. So I think. Um, the cloud is going to be used a heck of a lot more in capital markets. Um, and then um, um, blockchain, I don't see so much. I actually do mm. think it will be used for, um, you know, obviously ledger activities, um, but not for, you know, obviously one of the issues that we're trying to solve is huge amounts of real time data and throughput issues, et cetera. And, you know, so I keep being asked in the fintech world, you know, so what do you do? With blockchain, and we don't really do anything. Mm. Um, um, but I do think that, you know, it's sort of on the, it's on the downward part of the hype chain, the blockchain hype chain at the it, moment. But yeah, it may well but, but, but the, you know, but in the, it, for example, though, in the, you know, obviously so we, we're intending to do repos, but obviously I think uh, repos and how they're tracked and who, who owns those assets, etc. you can definitely see those moving over to um, uh, trading systems which are based on. On, on ledgers based on the blockchain, etc. So I definitely see they will affect us, um, although it may not be used as core to what we do. No, I think it's I think it's going to be an interesting time, and, and uh, winners and losers, and losers as always. But I think uh, you know everything that I've heard today and everything I know about the business already just makes me uh, utterly convinced it's uh, it's it's set for a continued ascent and uh, good times ahead for for transfer. Steve, thanks so much for, uh, for for sharing some of this in, insight with us all and going through some of the uh, ways that you are, are climbing the peaks of everything at the, at the moment. And I wish you continued uh, success with the business. I'm sure there's going to be people here who, who've been watching this and, and are sort of interested in Transfic and finding out a little bit more. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, well, if, if, if they're interested in joining as a developer, please ping your CV to recruitment at transfic.com. Uh, um, we've got a, a group email. Um, uh, info at transfic.com of general sales inquiries or you pay me direct on LinkedIn it's a, a specific question Fantastic, Steve thanks so much for, for uh, sharing every, everything with us and, and taking the time to talk today uh, thank you all for watching and we'll see you all soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV thanks, uh, thanks Steve, thanks a lot